Thank you, Eva. Labrit, man's name is the Zoran, Bauda Wood Shade. I have so much technology with me, I have to see which pocket is what. Um, so, I do come from Bosnia, and um, it's really um, reading about Latvia. This is my first time in Latvia in my life. Reading about Latvia, I see that there are many things which are different, but there are also many things which are very common to the two regions. And I realize, at least from looking from the Balkans towards the, uh, the Baltics, uh, we know so little about this part of the world. And I thought, you probably know equally little about my part of the world. So before telling you uh, what is social entrepreneurship in Bosnia, in, in the Balkan region, I wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, you know, my country, uh, a few words, uh, orient you a little bit, tell you a bit of my personal story, because I am a war veteran, even though I might not look so, and also I'm a currently a social entrepreneur. So I'm going to bring these two things together in the hope that you will actually understand why social entrepreneurship today uh, is really important for Bosnia, for the Balkans, and I think increasingly getting important as well for the rest of the world. Uh, so, so here are some facts. Uh, Bosnia, uh, Southeast Europe, we are, used to be part of Yugoslavia, and Yugoslavia fell apart in 1991, right after um, uh, Latvia became independent, uh, and we immersed in a, in a, in a um, terrible war. But before the war, um, and, and even today, Sarajevo was the capital, we are about 3.8 million people, slightly bigger than Latvia, and we speak, uh, at least on paper, three languages called uh, Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian, because Bosnia is comprised of the three ethnic groups. But actually, it's the same language uh, with a different dialect. Uh, but we call it differently because of the war, and we all want to have our own language. So we have three languages. Um, what happened at the beginning, and in a way what made me, I think, a social entrepreneur of today, um, is... Uh, is a terrible war that happened in my country. Um, and now I'm going to share a little bit of my personal story. From 1992 until 1995, um, our, our country lost around 100,000 people uh, in the war. Uh, and there were three ethnic, major ethnic groups fighting each other, even though at the beginning we were not religiously colored. It became also, in a way, a religiously colored conflict. So we have basically Serbs, uh, Croats, Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and the Bosnian Muslims. Muslims are about 50% of the population, Bosnian Serbs around 33%, and the Croats around 12%. Um, but before the war, we were all socialists, we were all um, Yugoslavs, so religion didn't really play much of the, of the role, and didn't really uh, affect so much of our identity. But the war started uh, in basically in Slovenia, ex went through Croatia, and arrived in Bosnia, and because we were so mixed, it really exploded in my country. Um, and I was 18 years old when, when I actually I was finishing my high school when, uh, when um, a friend of mine called me on the phone and she said, we are not going to school today. And I was so happy because we're not going to school. And, but the reason why we were not going to school is because there were barricades in Sarajevo. And it was not possible to basically go from one part of the city into another, into the other. Um, the war started and, and suddenly, you know, from being a high school, uh, from a very strict parents, you know, I had to be back home at a certain time. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks later, I was patrolling my neighborhood with, uh, with a Kalashnikov in my hands. No electricity in a big, in a big, um, in a big kind of neighborhood with very tall buildings. And it was so terrifying that in, in the neighborhood where I grew up, um, one, one night I was moving from one building to another and it was so pitch dark that I actually couldn't, couldn't find my building uh, because all the lights were gone, people were afraid of snipers, uh, and that's how the war started. Um, and I'll show you another, another, maybe one year into the, into the conflict, I was already one year a soldier, um, and I was coming back from, um, from, uh, from my front, the front line and going into, the, into the, my neighborhood. So Sarajevo basically you know, was divided to, during the war, and there were big buildings. Um, uh, which basically at, at the front line from my neighborhood. So it was spring and, and most people spend the, the, the winter in basements being afraid of shellings. Uh, so, so it was our first spring day and pe people and the children came out uh, to, to play basketball and, and you know, play chess, the older people. And because the buildings were so tall um, and it was a very beautiful and silent day, no shootings anywhere, uh, children came out and the parents were not, not able to say to their kids, you know, do not go out, you know, kids need to go out to play. 
So I was going back from the front line, uh, from, from the other side of the, of the city, and then suddenly three mortars were fired, uh, and the mortars are not, they don't fly like this, they basically fly like that. And they fell, three of them fell among the crowd. Um, and uh, basically, uh, that was the day when I, when I really, um, uh, for the first time ever, I, I, I felt, I actually helped carry what, dead people, wounded people. I carried a boy, maybe five, six years old, with blue eyes, um, who had a big hole in his back. Uh, and um, that was the day when I really, really thought that this is not a war for me and I have to, I have to leave this country. But unfortunately, um, the, uh, the city was under siege. It took another year and a half. I was wounded three times during the war. It took another year and a half to be able to leave the city and the country. And um, I had to illegally cross borders uh, from Bosnia to Croatia. I jumped the border also between uh, Croatia and Slovenia. I crossed the, the Alps between Slovenia and, and Austria. And I also crawled under the bridge between Austria and Germany. At that time, there was no Schengen, so there were still borders. Uh, and arrived in Germany where I was a refugee for about two and a half years. Um, that's my personal story and I always hated war. I never, I never wanted to belong to any of the, and the sides. I never wanted to kill anyone and I didn't, which is a good thing for me today. But I really feel very much uh, this, is, uh, this terrible experience is something which formed me into the person that I am today. Uh, and this is in a way what made me always want to create peace in my country. And this is what made me always want to create um, the most innovative ways how to bring people together, no matter if they are Bosnian, Serbs, Croats, or Muslims. Uh, I actually come from a mixed marriage, so for me it was always, always the same people. So this is a terrifying story, and, and I, I wanted to share it with you because um, on this, maybe on this slide before, um, uh, well, uh, yeah. On this slide, you know, today there's a big refugee crisis, and when you look at the map, they're basically going from Greece to Macedonia, from Macedonia to Serbia, and now they went to try to Hungary, and then are going to Croatia, to, to Slovenia, to Austria, and further into European Union. We are still not, we don't, don't have many refugees from, you know, from Syria, because we are still not considered the, the dream country of the, of the Syrian refugees. But as the, as the borders are closing down, we are basically expecting also refugees to, uh, to uh, uh, come to our country. And this is a very fragile area, as you know, today. Um, there, was, there were tensions between Serbia and Croatia because of the border crossings between the two. But I think that things are getting better. So even though we went to this terrible war, we're still now feeling these people leaving Syria. And even though we are some of the poorest countries in Europe, we are still uh, burden, uh, carrying a lot of the burden of, of taking care of these people along the way. Uh, But Bosnia is actually a beautiful country, and I, just be, I, I, I deliberately made the contrast between black and white and color, because it is a beautiful country, and if you ever get to come to Bosnia, it is very different from Latvia. We have a lot of mountains, uh, with a lot of waterfalls, um, we have a little bit of the Adriatic Sea, some 13 kilometers, bordering in Croatia, looking towards Italy. Uh, and this is a city where in 18, 1984 we had the Winter Olympics, just bef uh, five, six years before the war in my country. Some of you might remember, uh, many of you will not because you're too young to remember. Um, Bosnia is called after the river Bosnia, uh, Ibosana, which means water. And after the war, uh, we had something called the Dayton Peace Agreement, which actually is an agreement which created the peace in my country, but it also, also um, created a very complicated structure of government. So today, even we are 3.8 million people, we have two entities. Uh, one belongs to one ethnic group, the other belongs to the mixture of the two other ethnic groups, and a couple of people like me who are mixed, who don't belong anywhere or belong everywhere. Uh, and we basically have 10 cantons in one of the entities, and we have one part of the country for which we couldn't agree to whom it's going to belong, so we basically made it an independent uh, uh, district. So it's the, it's the 11th uh, or the 13th part of, of my country. The currency today is the Bosnian mark. It's because uh, after the war we used, because we didn't have our currency after the war, and we used the German, German mark. So the German mark is basically became the Bosnian mark after that, so we are probably the only non-Germans using the German still today. Uh, the exchange rate is the same as the, as the German mark at that time. And one interesting thing, if you come to Bosnia, you will definitely see that people love coffee. Uh, people sit and really enjoy their coffee. And that's some, something, how you can actually measure 
reconciliation in my country. If people are sitting together and if they have a coffee with neighbors, that means that they actually kind of went over the war which happened in the past. So, um, but however, it's not as, as, as beautiful as I painted in the last picture. Um, Bosnia, the Human Development Index um, value for 2013, we are 86 out of uh, 187. I, just for reference, I put Latvia 44. So we, you are Latvia, even though I know you probably, you probably think that you are the worst country in Europe or some of the worst countries in Europe, from my perspective, you're doing extremely well. Uh, and the same comparison in terms of even do, ease, ease of doing business, as you know, um, the World Bank is doing this um, um, survey called the Ease of Doing Business every year that they actually compare uh, different countries around the world in terms of how difficult or how easy to do is it to do business. Uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is number 79 and Latvia is 22, uh, which means Latvia is basically one of the best countries uh, in Europe and in the world to do business in. Um, Bosnia is number 79, which is basically at the European level. Uh, we are only better than Albania uh, and Kosovo. Any other country in, in, in the region and, and in Europe, is, and Ukraine, I'm sorry, Ukraine, uh, is actually doing better, uh, better than us. Um, so, there are many problems in my country. Youth unemployment is, uh, is extremely high. Is 63%. Uh, we have still a lot of distrust between the, the different ethnic groups, as I mentioned before. Uh, but our government is, because it's so complex nature of our government, doing advocacy. I know many of you come from the NGO sector. Doing advocacy is extremely difficult because you have 13 institutions to advocate to, and not all of them talk to each other. So you basically have to repeat the process so many times. It really, really is hard. So changing anything in this kind of setup is really, really extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, however, however, it is not impossible. Um, I started as an NGO worker in 97, and then I worked with USAID for about two years, uh, and then went back to NGOs again. I started a foundation some 14 and a half years ago, um, and I guess I was always an entrepreneur. Um, most of the sector in my country thought that our foundation is some, somehow different. We don't really belong into the NGO sector. When we were talking to businesses, we are so different. We don't really belong into the business sector. Um, and um, for many years, I thought it's, it's, it's probably us. We are just crazy. You know, what, what are we trying to achieve? And then um, in 2010, uh, I received a phone call from the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, which is together with Skoll and together with uh, Shoka, one of the leading uh, institutions for promotion of social entrepreneurship. And they, very long story short, they named me the social entrepreneur for Central and Eastern Europe uh, for the year 2010. And then that, that's the first actually time I heard that social entrepreneurship, that I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, and I started, I started getting invited to different forums across the world, including Davos and some other forums. And I realized that when I get to these forums, this is where I feel like at home. And I really hope that today I will he feel here as well as at home, because here we are different. We are not the NGO, even though we have all the values from the NGOs. We really want solidarity, democracy, uh, good for all the people, not just for, the, uh, for some of groups. On the other hand, we are also business, because we want to create value. We do not want to depend on donors only. We want to create value by producing goods or services. So this makes us very different. So when I actually arrived at the Social uh, Schwab's Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, I realized, oh my God, this is the group that I want to be a part of. And this is basically what made me happy. And it keeps making me happy from that moment on. Um, I'm going to play a little uh, video after this slide. But before I play the video, I wanted to uh, tell you, uh, we have actually two businesses and we have supported some over 20 in our region so far, and I'll tell you a bit more about our plans in the future later. Um, but um, one village in which we are doing the business, social business that I'm going to show in the video now, is based um, East Bosnia. It is the uh, second poorest municipality in the country. Um, it is just a couple of kilometers away, maybe 20 kilometers away, from the place where in 1995 we had the last uh, genocide uh, in the country where 7,000, almost 8,000 people were killed, executed over three days in the hearts of Europe. So you can imagine how difficult it is 
to build a business there, first of all, people are very afraid. They are, they are very distrustful. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to do a business there not because we wanted to preach reconciliation, because we wanted to empower women through seminars and workshop, but because we went there to create jobs. And because we believe that by creating jobs for women on both sides of the, um, the, of the war, of the front line, that is the, and of course engaging them in different discussions, and also by promoting, um, um, by promoting reconciliation in a much more active way, we believe that is the way how we tackle the, the value side that I would mentioned before through the business tools and approaches that I mentioned before. So, um, municipality of Sheikovic, East Bosnia, unemployment rate around 64%, they're mainly women. Uh, they, they are basically almost mono-ethnic now after the war. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ethnic mistrust. Uh, they are extremely rural. The municipality is very poor, uh, and there is there is some corruption. Let me. I hope the video will play now. Oh, oh, okay. How do we play the video? Okay, it's coming. It's coming. Great. So as we are waiting, oh, sounds strange when I talk to my ear. Pošto je to inače teško preživjeti, zato što je jedna nerazvijena opština, siromašna opština u kojoj stvarno firme ne rade. Kako mi je teško živjeti? Teško je živjeti zato što ljudi ne imaju primanje. U suštini ne imaju, znači svaki drugi stanovnik neko negdje ne radi. Bilo je teško kad se nije bilo posla, nije se znalo kvara. Djeca se školaju, pare trebaju. Muž radi, ali mala plata, ne mogu se djeca škola i djeca dobro uče. Svako jutro u šest sati šestdesetak žena iz Šekovića kroz šumske proplanke i makadamskom cestom odlaze na posao. I za ove netaknute prirode krije se najmoderniji staklenik na Zapadnom Balkanu. Staklenik u kojem se proizvodi začinsko bilje, med i povrće dao je ovim do jučer nezaposlenim majkama i suprugama nadu bolje sutra. Ja sam majka sedmero djece, očekujem osmu, nisam robila prije... Jesi išla sam rodila ovako ideš kupsi, jedno ko poje rodi sebi i tu koštreko nimam kravu, gledao mi je koč. Ali kad imaš svoje dinara ga neč kaš ni otko, boga mi najbolje. Pošto sam rada 27 godina u Šikovićima konfekciji i onda je firma propala, ošla u stečaj, ja sam ostala bez posla. Prvo sam bila četiri godine bez posla, a privatno stanujem. Pa sam se u Crnogoru radila i tamo vamo. Ovdje dođe ovo ekomozaik, dole su bili oglasi i održali su sastanak u kinosalu Šikovićima. Tu nam se došlo preko vjesta žena, koja ovo sve bez posla, ništa ono ne radi. I prijavimo se i ono čekali smo. Ovo za mene znači ne znam ni koliko. Neskutnika se ne radi. Sad mi je bolje, ali imam nadu. Tako smo se svi lijepo osjećali ipak da dobijemo na našoj opštini posao ipak. Pretežno muškarci idu na stranu da radu, a žene ostaju kod kuće, tako da imam mnogo nezaposlani žene. U ovaj staklenik uloženo je 2,9 milijuna maraka. Realizira ga fondacija Mozaik uz podršku USAID-a, a partneri projekta su Eko Mozaik i općina Šekovići. Eko Mozaik je počeo kao ideja da se uradi nešto što će donositi novac, ne samo mozaiku, nego i lokalnim zajednicama. I onda su ti ljudi iz mozaika tražili sredinu koja će ne samo željeti da je eko mozaik tu i da im pomogne, nego neka zajednica koja će također da investira nešto u cijeli taj projekat. Tako da su Šeković bilo idealno mjesto jer je opuštena nam dao prostor bivše kasarne Bišna na korišnju 20 godina i sav prostor okolo, znači su zemlje okolo. Zato su mi danas u Šekovićima. Do početka 2011. godine Šekovići su važili za jednu od najnerazvijenijih općina u kojoj je na tisuću nezaposlenih iz koje mladi ljudi odlaze. I onda, kažu ovi ljudi, kao da se dogodilo čudo. Najmoderniji staklenik na Zapadnom Balkanu otvara se baš u Šekovićima. Šekovići će tako sada biti prepoznatljivi diljem svijeta, a začinsko bilje iz ovog staklenika naći će se na trpezama diljem Europske unije.
Lavanda se veže samo za mediteranska područja, ali promjena klime i visoka tehnologija predviđaju na ovim područjima velike prinose lavande, koja će donijeti ogromne količine organskog meda. Lidija Frančić završila je studij agronomije u Beogradu i suočila se s prvim velikim životnim izazovom. Doći raditi u Šekoviće, u Bišinu gdje ni signal za mobilnu mrežu nikada nije dopro. Ovo je inače moj prvi posao i bio je zaista izazov da dođem ipak ovde, ali sam staklenik je bio izazovan, ta površina, tehnologija, inače staklenik je napravljen po posljednjoj tehnologiji, zazni sistem, provetravanje, navodnjavanje, znači sve ide kompjuterski, naravno opet potrebno je stručno lice koje će da upravlja time, I to je bio inače izazov i razlog zbog svog sam ja došla ovde. Imamo u planu da proizvedemo recimo 20 do 30 tona meda u nekoj osrednjoj godini, u nekoj jačoj godini normalno je bilo toga i više. Cilj svake normalne organizacije, svake ozbiljne firme da postane samo održiv, znači da proizvede nešto od čega bi mogli mi sve normalno da živimo, a ne da se oslanjamo samo na neke pomoći, na neke donacije, jer to ne može već to trajati. Sada je samo važno da ovaj 20-godišnji projekt opstane, jer ako ne, to bi za općinu visoke nezaposlenosti bio novi težak udarac. Ljepši osjećaj, hvala Bogu, zato što se ideš da zaradiš tu gnjevicu, kad skuči nemaš ništa, znači razmišljaš šta ćeš, nemaš djeca šta dati, nemaš zašto kupiti, djeca traže, a mi nemaš. Thank you. Um, as we are waiting for, oh, there it is already. Um, so one one thing I I didn't mention uh, introducing this municipality to you is the fact that um, for the first time ever in my country we uh, basically had an idea um, to go to municipalities and look to see what kind of resources they have available but not being used. Um, so in my country uh, there are there are a couple of ex-military. Um, facilities, uh, which were when the army came together after the war, many of these buildings were left unused. And these buildings are now were given to the local uh, municipalities for management. Um, this local municipality had um, this also military barracks uh, available, which they didn't use, and they were actually paying for uh, three salaries every, every month uh, for people to actually have to guard, uh, uh, safeguard the, uh, the barracks. Um, so when we came, uh, even though this is Republika Srpska, where the majority Serbs are, and we are, we are a foundation from Sarajevo, where majority Bosniaks or Muslims are, uh, and you can imagine the tension uh, or distrust you, you have when you arrive there, still somehow we manage, after a couple of meetings, to build this uh, essential level of trust uh, and come to an agreement where the, the government, the municipality, uh, passed a decision on the municipal council to give us free of charge this uh, rather large military uh, facility for 20 years free of charge. So we are now in, in about fifth year of this, of this uh, free rent. Uh, and we have, uh, we have actually met everything we promised to the, to the local municipality in terms of job creation. And also uh, what happened with, with the company, um, I explained some of the products we are producing, but we were not happy um, just by having the, the company only based in one city because we import around 60% of our food and our country actually even before the war Yugoslavia was one of the leading berries producer uh, in Europe. Uh, or meanwhile Poland took over this position but it was Yugoslavia before the war especially this part of East Bosnia where we produce most of our strawberries and blueberries. Um, so we basically, uh, there are companies who are working uh, in, in type of a cooperative with these uh, men and women um, and families in rural areas, uh, but we actually decided to follow the same steps with a bit, bit of a different business model, because at the, biz at the social business, our number one objective is not profits. Our number one objective is to bring development to, to these families in rural areas and help them have income, because as I mentioned before, this is a very poor country. Um, so what we do, our business model, and now is extending, and only this year we engaged 197 families, new families, into our, uh, into our business model, where we basically uh, produced in our greenhouse uh, the seeding material, the baby plants which we then distributed to these 197 families and are growing strawberries and blueberries and we are now organizing the collection of all these 
um, uh, all, all the produce, which will then be sent to, to the foreign markets. Um, there, there is a market for that, and Bosnia is one of the increasingly more important uh, players uh, in this market in Europe. Right now, many of our companies export to Sweden, um, and export also to, the, um, to, the, um, uh, to Russia, to the Republika Srpska. So we are basically still able to, to access the markets of the both worlds, you know, the ex-Soviet uh, ex Union territories, including Russia, and also to the Western countries, because we have a fair trade agreement, a uh, free trade agreement with the European Union. So our business model is basically slightly different, because we, all, we give uh, um, all the all the produce, all the seeding material, and and the and the and the um, agricultural materials necessary for production of berries and and uh, and other types of berries, strawberries and other types of berries, and we don't charge for that. But we actually charge for that once the once the product, once the strawberries are with us. So basically, they pay they pay us. Uh, we first of all we give fair prices to the, to our to our people in our. So sort of a cooperative, but at the same time, they only, we, uh, we only deduct the amount which we gave them upfront from the from the from the money coming from the from the sales. In that way, um, the, the local producer is running uh, very little risk. Uh, most of the risk is taken by by our social enterprise, by the company, and by, by the foundation. Uh, while at the same time, um, they are also guaranteed the collection of the the market, the collection of these of these uh, these products. One other thing which makes us different is because we uh, distributed this now across the country and because uh, one of the major dangers for agriculture is the weather conditions. Um, and uh, if we have hail or, or the ice falling from, uh, from the clouds, uh, which, which means that you know, some crop might get destroyed. So what we will do is we have a reserve number of seeding material every time. So if something like that happens, we are, we are going to give uh, free of charge the you know the replacement in terms of materials, still the 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 um, the, uh, um, the farmer will lose uh, will lose a lot of it his or her labor because of the weather conditions. But at least it's not going to start from scratch. We will come in and and bring uh, all the replacement materials for them. So we we are both losing. So it it, it is an interest of both of us to actually um, uh, to actually have have a good year and and, and good um, a good yield. Um, so basically, um, Eco Mosaic is just to go back a little bit in terms of how we structured it. Uh, as you can see, this is clearly a company. This is, as I as I saw also in, uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, in Latvia you have other foundations or or businesses. It is very much the same in my country. There is no special law on social entrepreneurship. And to be honest, um, I'm not sure how we can develop such law when there are so few good examples from anywhere in the world, then again, this is not an excuse for us not to do social entrepreneurship. There, you know, there should be no excuses. We have to, our country needs our assistance. We need to do better if we want to catch up with the rest of Europe. So no excuses, we have to do the work. So even though it took a lot of risk and a lot of work, uh, we are now um, there and, and you probably we are set up in a similar way as you are set up in, in Latvia. So foundation cannot do the, the work directly because we we are registered under the law on on foundations. So we basically register a separate legal entity, which is a limited liability company, which is pretty much what you do, I think, in Latvia. So all the proceeds, all the dividends from these companies, if any, well, actually in one other country we decided to pay the dividend. In this country, we are, in this company, we all the time are investing. So. Dividends one day will be basically after we pay the profit tax will be given back to the foundation for for the actual foundation work. Um, so it's not uh, it is not actually if you look back and see how difficult it is to run a business in Bosnia. Remember Latvia 22, Bosnia 79. Um, it is really really hard. But we are I think an example that hard work and taking some risk and very important in very good partnership with local government. Uh, and with partners who are, represent foreign markets, we can actually build a successful business model which brings benefit to the people in the rural areas. And through that, that's how we communicate that, but through that we're also bringing reconciliation, we're bringing women empowerment, we're building job creation, we're actually building a generation of people who are at least a little bit less unhappy because of everything that happened. Um, I think I'll stop here and I'll, I'll be happy for, to get more um, 
questions and answers on regarding this later, and I left somewhere at the end of this. Uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about the foundation, actually. You saw what the company does, and we have another company, which, which I'm not going to go into today, which is also profitable. Um, the foundation, um, we actually realized that we are the leaders in the Balkans in terms of youth empowerment. Uh, we run the largest youth empowerment community development program in the Balkans uh, over the last seven years. And uh, so over the last seven years, we funded some 1,200 community projects uh, and we engaged some um, uh, 16,700 volunteers up to last year, this year, a couple of thousand more. Um, and these people together, every time together with the local municipality, which is a partner on the project, we fund community actions of young people in, in these municipalities. Um, we realize that this approach, uh, no matter how good it is in terms of youth empowerment, it's just not enough. Because these people in rural areas, they do a community project, it lasts for a couple of months, and they're gone. Um, and when you ask the people there what is what you, what you need the most in your community, it is actually jobs. So we kept struggling with this issue of jobs because jobs is not something that the international community usually funds. Uh, but then again, this is something where we need to you know, develop because obviously that's needed in our villages and in our rural areas. Um, so basically, uh, we decided to build a completely new strategy. Uh, and um, we actually believe that in a country like Bosnia, in order to change something, it cannot be a three, four year project funded by the European Union. It has to be something much more long term. So we were bold enough to start a process three and a half years ago to build a new strategy which would use social entrepreneurship as a way to build a new powerful generation of young people who can then serve as role models to our kids, to our, you know, to our young people of the future. Um, I don't think the role models are often as we are as we see them you know, from these donor-funded projects. Because a role model, at least for us in Mosaic Foundation, has to be somebody who knows how to create jobs. And somebody who has the values that uh, Yeva mentioned before. Um, so basically, we are building a new strategy where we are using the community work to do the good work in the community and, and using that as a platform to recognize the most promising young people, value-driven, number one and number two, that potential to be entrepreneurs. And we're helping them become social entrepreneurs. We're now in the first year of, of, of uh, testing that, and, and we are launching the big new strategy of 10 years uh, next, next May. And basically, we are so excited because we actually, we really believe that when we have three or 400 social entrepreneurs built like this, this is the voice we can actually affect the government in terms of you know, legislation of bus uh, you know, uh, ease of doing business, how to make business, but also how it's gonna be for the community, not for the individual itself. Um, so there are several building blocks of this strategy, but I think um, I need to finish, uh, and <laughs> it's going like that. Uh, and this is our 10 year, oh, sorry, 10-year strategy, uh, and it's much more elaborate than this. We kind of turned it into some sort of a log frame, but it's not a log frame. And basically, um, this is a completely different logic. We basically not, we're stating the impact rather as something which is measurable for 10 years rather than stating the outputs as something which is measurable. Because we, we don't really focus so much on the outputs. It's just a management tool for, for the foundation staff. But I, I have a feeling that I'm confusing you too much, but in general, in general, this is my last slide, uh, uh, social entrepreneurship is, for a country like Bosnia, which is very small, and I guess for Latvia as well, it's not easy. But if we manage to, to create new wealth driven by new value and, and benefit for the community rather than for the personal gain and for the personal interest, then we can actually expect something to change. A neoliberal concept of capitalism which is burning its resources, is not going to be the solution for our countries. And I think, at least for Bosnia, something we're going to really game for, and hopefully in a couple of years from now, I'll be here again and tell you some of the more of the results. So, Paldies, thank you very much. Thank you. The story.
likes. And now is the time for questions. I know that Latvians are not very active. No, I'm mistaken. We are. Thank you, Eva. We had not prearranged this. I have a burning question, Zoran, because to everybody to whom I've been telling about the Echo Mosaic, I always tell the honey story. You didn't say a word about the honey story. Could you please <laughs> elaborate a little bit uh, and also explain a bit more how you started, uh, how, how, how you started Echo Mosaic in practical terms? Yes, uh, thank you for reminding me that. So the first idea when, when going to Shekovic was, okay, this place is the middle of nowhere. What can we, what, what activity, economic activity can we build in this place? Because there's nothing, there's no infrastructure, there's only clean nature. Ah, clean nature. And then we took back and looked, analyzed different businesses and we realized that Bosnia has a lot of clean areas, amazing honey. And, and decided, why don't we just turn this disadvantage of bad infrastructure with you know, uh, no factories and no access into the uh, advantage, uh, corpor um, uh, corporate uh, advantage. And this is how the idea was born. Uh, rather than complaining and say there's no infrastructure, oh, well, let's use this as a fact. There's no infrastructure, great, let's do honey. There's not even cell phones until last year we didn't have there. No internet, no cell phones in the company. Um, so idea, as some of you might know, cell phones sometimes distract or disturb the, the, the bees in the bee colonies. So that was a simple solution. What can we do in a place where there is really nothing that can be done said by the local people? So we, we actually went back to honey and built this, uh, some sort of a cooperative as well uh, for, uh, for honey production. Uh, and I, I couldn't bring any honey because it is, we are outside of the EU and I only had hand luggage. Uh, I tried this once, they took it away from me, uh, I forgot. Um, so this time I didn't bring any honey, but we have one of the best honeys in Bosnia. Uh, and it's how everything is sold up front in our country. So that's how the whole story started. It started basically small. I, I showed you the big picture. And thank you, Eva, for reminding us. We started really, really small uh, with honey production. Any other questions? I can be, I can keep silence for quite some time waiting for questions, but I see that we, we have a question. I just wanted to ask you, how uh, is the situation looking in Bosnia currently with the refugees? And uh, what do you see as a maybe good recommendation for Latvia is we have also agreed to accept a, a few hundred, <laughs> which is very little, but uh, maybe you see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? Um, absolutely. I can. Um, right now in Bosnia, we don't have many, like I said, because maybe just a few, because Bosnia is not a promised land of, for, the, for the Syrians uh, or for the economic refugees. Um, but I can tell you from my own experience being a refugee in Germany, um, I learned, I was there for two and a half years. I learned fluently German. I you know, had a very good job, uh, worked, in, worked in a factory for almost two years. Added value to the German economy. Uh, if I was sent to a camp uh, with, you know, with all other refugees, I would probably spend my two or three years there waiting for something to happen, not have learned German, uh, German language, not have learned the culture, not have learned the working habits. So if, if I can give any, any suggestion for, for Latvians, uh, do not put them together. Separate them as much as you can, uh, and then try to integrate them into your economy. And you know, these people are coming. Um, first, they want peace and something, you know, safety for their for their children. Uh, and they're going to probably take any types of jobs. Uh, sometimes not even wanted by Latvians. Sometimes they're going to be very qualified. I, I would say just embrace them as much as you can, uh, and give them open up the possibilities for them. Uh, do not give them limited working permits because that's only going to create a, a, a nightmare for the government to manage the whole thing. The best would be just to, to uh, if you're only receiving two or three hundred, to be open, uh, open-minded, and, and, and uh, uh, enable them access. Paldies. Can I ask another question? And there, there's, uh, there's some more questions uh, coming now. We're warming up. I represent a private business incubator at university in Riga. And the question is about your business model. Could you stress once more about clients 
uh, client segment or client groups. Uh, and the next question about management team. How many people are working in your management team and are you actually having a business model drawn on a paper? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, this is, um, we have everything drawn on a paper um, and it looks quite complex as the slide that I showed you before. In terms of the whole, we actually call it the non-profit corporation rather than a social enterprise, because social enterprise is not translatable into our language. So we kind of came up with a term non-profit corporation, meaning you know, one entity owns other entities. Some of them are for-profit, some of them are non-profit, but altogether they are non-profit, because no money gets paid to the shareholders. And everything is in there, everything gets reinvested, either at the foundation level or at the company level. So basically, uh, the foundation owns the two separate legal entities uh, limited liability companies and within this company that, that I portrayed are there we basically have our board of the foundation be the the assembly of the limited liability companies while the management of the foundation represents the board of these companies and then we have a separate team completely separate this is very important very separate from the foundation uh, who are, there's the director, and of course there's the accounting, uh, you know, there are some support functions, and there is one person who's managing um, the, uh, the cooperative in terms of uh, berry business, and there's one person that's managing the greenhouse, and there's one person managing the, uh, the beekeeping business. So what we try to do is um, make sure that the businesses are value, uh, uh, socially uh, solidar solidarily driven by us being on the board, but we hired people for, to manage these companies from the business sector. And, and also at the foundation level, we are increasingly, uh, as our strategy is changing and we are trying to bring more economic value for social benefit, our team is slightly changing as well. And just over the last two years, uh, we hired more people uh, at, the whole non, at, at the whole corporation level, corporate level, and we are around, even in the foundation, we are around 30% people coming from the business sector. So I think um, the management basically is always, you know, people driven by, by values, people driven by profits, uh, but the ones driven by values actually manage the ones driven by profit. You know, they sit on their boards. So it's not a perfect setup. Uh, there are definitely lessons to be learned because somebody who is neoliberal cannot run this kind of business. But at the same time, because we are sitting on the board, we are, we are trying to, um, to find a person who is business, but also have social responsibility feeling towards, towards the community. Um, one other thing to, to mention that when we were de de devising the whole thing, uh, we, were, we turned to a, um, IFC, uh, International Finance Corporation, uh, and then for the first time ever there was a non-profit corporation applying for something they call assistance in corporate governance. So we basically organized the whole governance as any corporation would by, by carefully reinstating some of the kind of corporate governance systems with a kind of more of a non-profit mindset inside to ensure that all the money and all the value creation goes towards towards a common good. Good morning and thank you very much for your story and presentation. Uh, can you describe please a bit your cooperation with local municipality? Do you have any? And... Um, Thank you. Yes, um, we are always in cooperation with local municipalities. In the youth project that I mentioned, um, they are always co-funding our initiatives. So for every euro that we give as a grant, as a foundation, municipality has to give at least one euro on top of that, and they do it very gladly. So um, some of them even, some mayors even used uh, in addition to everything they've done in their municipalities, they used our youth project as something they've done during the last four years, so they're running for mayor the next four years, so the major campaign goes around some of our project. We're not, we're not very comfortable about that, but then again, you know, they really were helpful, uh, so we, don't, we didn't really object. So we're working with all the political parties, no matter whether they're ethnic or, 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 you know, and, or, or, or not. Um, so that's in the, in the youth project. Uh, on the on the, in the, in the businesses, the one that I showed, the whole um, the whole area, the land and uh, and the buildings uh, come from the military uh, facility, which is given to us by the government, by the local government, municipality government. So we are very thankful to them for acknowledging and trusting us and and and, and kind of entering this public-private partnership for the first time since the war in my country. 
which again set the ground for other others to do the same in the future. I think, I think social entrepreneurship is very much in, aligned with the interests of local municipalities. Uh, and there's, you know, whatever is not used very well in the municipality should be transparently offered to those people who are not there to make 20, 30 or whatever return on investment. Uh, those are people who are just trying to make a living and, and create a better livelihood for the people in the municipality. They don't have to earn 10% of return on investment or whatever. You know, I know from 7% up, they, you know, different companies work. If we only have 2 or 3% return on investment, or if we're only profitable, that's more than enough for us, because profit is not the number one uh, uh, motivator for us. So if you are sitting there for municipalities and you know that you have a building, land, uh, whatever, which you're not using, and, and, and businesses are not interested in this, well, maybe a social business would be interested. It's about building this relationship together, and I'm sure that not always, but in some cases, um, this actually might work out very well for both sides. Um, I, ha I have a question. Uh, uh, about the, the very beginning and the first seed money and investments, where, where did the money come from and, and what were maybe the terms? Was it like a regular NGO grant or was it more like an investment? They wanted to have shares in the, in the company or how did, how did that work out? Uh, this is another difficult area for us. Um, and um, First, we as a foundation, we had some of our own money available. So the first money is basically came from my internal reserves. So that's the first one. Uh, and the, every, every larger pot of money we received came as a donation to the foundation. Because in a, in a way, these businesses, social businesses, represent an extended hand of our mission. So we're not doing something else some, uh, over there. We're actually doing the same thing. We're just using different tools to get to the same objective. Um, but still, it was very difficult to communicate to, uh, to donors. Um, they are just afraid of whatever you have a word business. They are so afraid of that, and they wouldn't. So this kind of non-profit cooperation setup was really beneficial in this case because the foundation would apply for the funding, and the, and the business would do the work. Um, and of course, uh, the, the the project monitoring and the project evaluation would go in both legal entities equally because we are coming come as a pack. So it's really hard to talk to donors about that. But I must say they are increasingly. Um, increasingly other um, a number of other t types of donors who are thinking along these lines uh, and we are slowly coming coming in touch with them just next week uh, it will be the European Venture Philanthropy Association forum in Madrid and this is the place where actually philanthropists come to discuss development EVPA and we, which was really interesting there is that coming from an NGO sector um, to this conference for the first time uh, is actually I realized that they see philanthropy as the money which they will give away. No matter what, this is money spent. But there's a number of people who think now, well, if I really want to create impact, why don't I just give the money to these social businesses and hope that they will give it back to me? So if they give back to me 100% of what I gave them, and I was going to give this away anyway, but if I manage to invest in these uh, NGOs and social enterprises, which will return the money, if they give 100% way uh, back, that's great, that's amazing. But if they give only 25% back, that's also good. It's 25% better than in the first place when I was going to give 100% away. So this logic is slowly coming, it's becoming more adopted by donors, which is do impact, look for different tools to do this impact, and try to recuperate the money by investing in the best such cases around the world. Um, and there's an increasing number of these, uh, these kind of thinkers in Europe and around. And, and I think the, time, the, the times are becoming better for people like us. And I still would think that probably EU would be the number one source for, for you to start with, uh, being from Latvia, uh, some private foundations as well. But uh, the venture philanthropists, uh, the impact investors, um, are definitely the, the, you know, the increasingly important choice among the choices. Thank you. As we can see, the, the question segment is that part, that uh, part, uh, the question section, question and answer session um, uh, helps us to understand uh, it all better. And I think at this point, this is going to be the last question now. Uh, we don't see you standing behind the column. 
Thank you very much, uh, Zoran, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Agrita Gruz and I represent uh, state institution, Ministry of Welfare. And the uh, Ministry of Welfare of Latvia uh, now are starting to implement a project on uh, support to social entrepreneurship. And um, my question as a representative from the state institution, of course, is that on state issues. And uh, I would like to ask you what kind of, of support uh, you would like to uh, receive more from the state institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad to get this question from the government representative behind the, behind the column. Um, you know, what, um, for me, it's the, it's the question of the fairness in the market. So if you are a regular conventional business and you have a business idea, um, you can basically go to a bank and to an investor and depending on the quality of the idea, get the starting financing for your, for your regular conventional business, if the business is going to return investment, return on investment. Um, if you are a social business, uh, and I have tried it, uh, you go to a bank, this kind of business of doing business for not for, to give the money away is not really attractive to banks or investors. They ask, why would you do business and not make money personally for that? This is really strange. And people think in my country it must be corruption. It must be something hidden behind this because why would somebody you do it for free? You know, not, not return the money on, on the investment. So this is where the government can come in. And I think uh, the government can play a crucial role in helping the startups. Uh, the same as you are, like I mentioned before, this concept of giving the money to the to the, um, to the social businesses and then hopefully get some of the money returned. Uh, and if some of the money comes back, great. If it doesn't, well, we were going to give the money away in the first place anyhow. Um, so I think the government can play this role very, very increasingly, uh, helping uh, social business startups because uh, I, I don't think it can replace the typical incubators and startup uh, and, and accelerators, but it can definitely provide a different different arena for these social entrepreneurs to actually try to do something without risking their whole savings and their mortgage on their apartments and houses and so on. So I think the government, in order to make, my, my first sentence was how to regulate the fairness between regular businesses and social businesses. I think in this case of startup, access to startup fin financing, social businesses are in the worst position. And this is where the government should come in to make social businesses fair, access to financing, fair or same as, as regular business. And this is where we can play uh, equally in the market, you know, compete everybody in the market. As I realized, I'm really bad at saying no. There are going to be two more questions. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> so, one there. Uh, hello, thank you for the presentation. I have a very practical question. I'm pr uh, pres representative of a private business which is looking at possibilities in social business. And my question is um, uh, not about exact numbers, not about, you know, <laughs> I'm not looking something uh, exact, but uh, as a social business, you are, of course, it's not about return on investment, it's not about s certain profit, but still uh, people who like, uh, like, like you as a key person to mm -hmm. several uh, big businesses, still you have to eat, you have to pay for the housing, and you know, <laughs> you can't feed your family by ideas, yes. yeah? Yes. Uh, what are the underlying principles of compensating your time, your mm -hmm. skills? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's different. I'm the director of our foundation, so I have a fixed salary okay. in the foundation. But the businesses are regulated in a way that it works as it would work in the market. We cannot, if, if for, I'll, I'll, let me give an example. The manager of this business that I showed, Eco Mosaic, um, our business is competing against a similar business and several of those in, in our country with a different business model. Um, and we're all competing in the market. Uh, and he currently is, is a guy, uh, he uh, needs to feed his family. Uh, and we really want to keep him motivated. So what we're trying to do basically is have a package where you have the, you know, the good, good base salary and then percentage in the, in the, earn, in the profits, basically. Um, by doing so, we are basically providing a package which is equally motivating as in any other business in the market, but adding something different to the equation, which is, you know, we're doing it not because somebody is going to get ridiculously rich, but because we are helping other people. 
So I think this is a package for which many, that this is why when I said around 30% of our foundation are more and more increasingly business people, people uh, moved into foundation even to a lower salary because of this fulfillment. And we are paying good salaries, you're not paying, you know, um, not a problem, but which is what I read from the, re from the report. Um, you know, it's hard to pay, this issue of remuneration is really a difficult part. But we have to pay, pay people a market salary, otherwise they will go um, to another company uh, because they have families to feed. So putting a package together which is fair, uh, which is competitive, and not necessarily in terms of quantity of money you've earned, you can earn a little bit less than another company. You know, after some amount, we know that doesn't really matter if you earn, I don't know, 2,500 euros or 2,600 euros. But the feeling that, uh, I'm not earning that much, by the way. Uh, but the feeling that, um, that you actually contribute to the society, to some people, not to all, means a lot. And this is, this is part of our package. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and the last question is there are, no, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say no, but there will be time to think and to talk and to ask questions to Zoran, I promise. Uh, hello, my name is Diana Lovkis and I represent Social Entrepreneurship Accelerator here in Latvia. Thank you very much, it was very interesting and uh, I'm very interested to know if you, uh, which, which is your plans for the future in your country and do you help to new social entrepreneurs to turn their idea into reality? How you cooperate in your country? Do you mentor them or something? Uh -huh, that, that's a good question. Um, um, in my country, uh, which is an ex-socialist communist country, we don't really have many entrepreneurs. So, contrary to, for example, my colleagues in Berlin, when they have, uh, when they have a, a vacancy in the newspapers or in the portal that they want to fund 100 social businesses, they get 500 ideas of people who want to become entrepreneurs. In my country, that doesn't work. People want to work for a municipality for the government. So, in order to compensate for that, this is called the pipeline in our language. The pipeline is missing. The pipeline is missing not only for the regular businesses, it's missing even more for social businesses. So, rather than waiting for somebody to wake up one morning and, and think, I, I might be a social entrepreneur, even though I have no idea what it is, uh, we are building a pipeline. So, this youth project that I mentioned to you is a pipeline. That's this part of, first part of the whole new general strategy. The second part is about uh, a startup incubator and an accelerator, which we are putting together right now, and 20 people are just under, currently undergoing. And the idea is basically to create, to be able to give birth to around 50 businesses a year as of year three. Because we need a good number of people who are social entrepreneurs to be able to affect policies and to affect the, generally the markets in my country. So yes, we provide mentorship. There's a very intensive curriculum which we are giving online and in person. Uh, there are personal mentors, there are general mentors, um, there are uh, industry-specific mentors which we are developing right now, a whole network of that. We are working with our diaspora, which is many of them in Sweden, Germany, United States, somewhere else, to come back to mentor our entrepreneurs. We are talk talking to the local business community as well. To, um, mentorship is a big problem in Bosnia, probably in Latvia as well. We don't have enough good people to do that, so we are reaching out to Serbia and Croatia as well. So for us it's basically, in a volatile situation uh, like Bosnia, where doing business is so hard, how do we provide safety? We did a survey, and number one problem why they don't become entrepreneurs is because they don't feel safe. They don't know what's going to happen. The uncertainties are, are tremendous. So by working with us, they would basically help them go from one step to another, and they feel actually quite safe with us. So that, that's how our incubator differ, difference, differentiates from, from other incubators in the country, because we give actually more assistance than any other incubator in the country, and we also give around 20,000 euro startup grants at the end of the process. So, yeah, this is, I think this is, you know, this is the cutting edge and, and currently very fashionable incubators, accelerators. We are doing it as well, but our major objective is not only to build businesses, is to build critical mass of entrepreneurs who create jobs, create new economic and social values, and then serve as a role model to other people and the other young people in my country. Okay, thank you, Zoran. Great. Thank you so much. Stay around. But yes. now they're going to work. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.